Yeah, um, just to make a link back to where we finished, at least in terms of my presentation, when I was speaking to you about the learning cycle, the experiential learning cycle, it was very good. Um, recently, I was at a, an event in Tallinn and I uh, was presenting on very similar sorts of ideas. And I asked the group, now they were from the d different parts of Europe, if they'd heard of Kolb and the experiential learning cycle, and they all said no. <laughs> so it was a point of reference that I wasn't able to, to give to them. So it's very good that we have something that is, is more or less commonly un understood that we can start from in this next thing. Now, I've got two purposes here. One, I'm picking up on that notion that it's very difficult to make what at first sight appears to be intangible, tangible. So how do we make those moments or those kinds of things explicit? And that's partly why a focus on outcomes is useful here. It's not going to answer the whole problem, but it can take us some way. So that's my first point. My second point is uh, on that issue that I spoke about before, that a lot of the experience and the knowledge is locked up in new people. And a lot of it, and um, making that connection to Cobb's learning cycle, one of the problems with that as a model is that it's very individualistic. It's very psychologistic, if that's a, a correct word. It's a kind of an internal mental process. Now, there's a whole sorts of set of issues about how we develop knowledge between us uh, uh, as people. And a counter to that notion is that we actually develop knowledge through dialogue between each other. And that takes you into a completely different space. It takes you into a public space. And that's where I'm going to go now in talking to you about a theory of change. So it's about lifting what is inside into a more explicit space so that we can talk to each other about what it is that we think we're doing, why we're doing it, what we hope to get out of it. And when we're explicit in that way, we've got a better chance of seeing whether what we said we're going to do, we're actually doing, and we're doing it to a standard. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're performing to a, a certain sort of standard. But more importantly, we can involve other people, outsiders, researchers are one group that we need to involve in that process, okay? So that's what I'm presenting now in the, in the next few minutes, how a theory of change or a theory about theory of change might be able to help us, even if the language obviously has to be adapted and appropriated for your own purposes, which I can see that you're all very well capable of doing. So. <coughs> So, but the first thing that I, wa I want to mention is this kind of vex thing about theory. Uh, somebody in my, my group was talking about the need for better links between theory and practice, or between academia and practice. And it is always a problem in, in youth work. It might be a problem in other professions, for all I know, but I've spent my life around youth workers and community workers. When you ask people to talk about theory, even people who are freshly out of a three or four year degree program, they find it very difficult to articulate the theoretical underpinnings. And I'll show you what I mean by this in a minute. But Elizabeth Shaw is somebody that I've come across. She works out of an American context. Part of her project is to put an alternative view across about what constitutes evidence. Okay? So she has taken on what she calls the randomistas. The randomistas are the people who say that the only credible evidence that we can get comes from randomized controlled trials, which is what you were referring to uh, earlier on this morning. Now, we're not going to go into the, the, the methodology, the techniques of randomized controlled trials. But just to clock that again, there is a certain notion that only certain kinds of research count and only certain kinds of evidence counts. Now, Elizabeth Shaw produces a very compelling argument to show the limitations of that approach and she opens up possibilities for us that I think that we could all embrace and that are suitable to our own purposes. Now there's a link to a really interesting paper that she wrote not too long ago on this topic so you can have a look at that at your own leisure. Now um, one of the things that she does say is this is that together with the information that you get from consultation together with the knowledge that's in communities and in people, you have to bring theory to that party as well. 
And that provides the basis then for the practice. So theory is an essential component. I'll just spend a couple of minutes on, on theory. So why theory? If we become explicit about theory, yeah, we can challenge our own assumptions and we can explain better what it is that we are doing. Now, the answer to the problem about how we make the intangible tangible, which is the thing that you raised for us, is theory is part of that answer. Theory, going back to the sources, going back to the literature, going back to the research, is part of the answer. We've forgotten it, but we can recover it. Okay, because most of us in training and in other situations have come across it, but we tend to park it in a particular kind of place. If we revisit it, then it helps us with the, with the language issue, and it makes what we say a lot stronger. Thank you. So, now I'm not going to go into to any of these. Now, this is just a quick snapshot of the range of theoretical sources that are available to underpin youth work practice. So, even if you've never heard, or think you've never heard, of some of these theories, some of these great thinkers. In fact, they do underpin a lot of the training and a lot of ideas that you have come across. It's just that they've been kind of buried. And that's something that we need to revisit and make explicit as a field of, of practice. We might be more used to things like Freire. Freire? Yeah, OK, and of course, Marx, that whole idea of the class struggle and, and, and so on. But some of the other bits we tend to have forgotten. OK, thank you. Now, even if you get the theory, even if you've done the consultations, moving it on to that next stage, there can be a gap okay, between what you think you want to do and what you actually do do in the end. And into that space comes it's intangible, it's difficult to express, there's a kind of magical thing happens and, and so on. What we're going to try to do now is just to see whether we can put some words into that space. Okay, so this is a familiar starting point for most people, okay? So you have goals, and you have goals even before you think you've got goals. You're set off in a particular direction. You've got particular purposes. Sometimes this is at the level of feeling in terms of what you want to do or what you want to achieve. Okay? Sometimes these are formalized in terms of mission statements or in terms of vision statements. Sometimes the goals are written out. Sometimes, even better, what you want to do is based on a rigorous needs analysis. And by needs, I don't mean just the kinds of things that are meant to be problematic about people or communities. I mean the kind of things that they say are needed and required in particular situations. So rigorous needs analysis. Yeah? Now the next step normally for people would be to say, right, OK, I've got some sort of idea of the, the needs and the requirements of this situation, so I'm going to develop some objectives which will then help me to plan where I'm going. That's not what we do in logic modeling. So if we go to the next slide, what you would do here is you go straight to outcomes. So you'd say, right, in this situation, what is the preferred outcome? What is the change that I'm wanting in this situation, or we are wanting as a result of our <coughs> discussions? And can we articulate those? Can we articulate those outcomes? And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on langu uh, the language of outcomes just now, but we're not going to go into this in too much detail. So if we go to the next slide. This is a bit difficult to read. And I'm really going to concentrate on this bit here, this column here, and maybe one or two examples from this. Okay. So what do we mean by a change, and what do we mean by changing people? Okay. So what do we mean? We mean changes in knowledge what people know. We mean changes in skills, what people can do. We mean changes in behavior, the way that people kind of operate and the things that they do. And we also mean changes in attitudes and beliefs. 
Now, there can be attitudes and beliefs about all, all kinds of things, yeah? So uh, I'm not good enough to go to university or whatever it is, or I'm, I'm not good enough to get a proper job, or I don't deserve, you know, that kind of thing. There can be big social-wide beliefs about, uh, well, white people are obviously a lot better than black people. And men, you know, they're a lot smarter than women. You know, that kind of stuff. The sorts of things that we spend a lot of our time confronting and, and challenging, okay? So, changes in four areas. Changes in four areas. And we can begin to break those down. Now, here's some sample statements. They might not be perfect, but they're a beginning in terms of articulating what those things are. So, some of this is very familiar to, to you. So, in terms of attitudes and beliefs, for example, Enhance confidence, self-esteem, awareness, personal and social. Or being more open to people from diverse backgrounds. Now, there's another step, and this is where it gets difficult. Okay? You've got to say, so how do we know if that is occurring? And that's the language of indicators. Okay? How do we know? That's an outcome. So what is an indicator that that is actually taking place? So how do we know that somebody is more open to diverse backgrounds? Okay? And two things we need here. Two things. One, if we're talking about change, we need to know what? First of all, what do we need to know? Where you are now. Where you are now. Exactly. That's, that's the baseline. You need to know where you are now, where you're going. That's the, that's the outcome. Obviously, particular to the situation that you are dealing with, and then it's a case of how do you indicate that change and how can you measure it. So that's the kind of principle that we are talking about here. Now, these, this, that language at the top is the kinds of outcomes that you would normally associate with face-to-face -face work in youth work. Okay, That's f the kind of outcomes that you get from that practice. If you get these, this is the idea, if you get these, you start to get some other sorts of outcomes that other sorts of people value. And these outcomes are in terms of education. They're in terms of relationships with adults. Yeah. They're in terms of health. They're in terms of social conditions, economic conditions, safety, the whole rest of it. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that if we do our job, then you get these other goodies. And how do we know you get these other goodies? We know that from the research that is available. So that can be testified to from these other things. But what we're talking about today is how you incorporate this in your practice. So how this kind of language, this kind of understanding might be helpful to you in your practice. So the idea is this, is that you don't go from where this started from to that end point. Now, we all know this kind of intuitively. It comes if it comes at all in, in stages. And if it comes at all, it might be fitful. It might be two steps forward. It might be one step back. Somebody might only ever take that one step and not another. And then others might. So we're not talking about an automated process where everybody starts here and the goes there. We're dealing with human beings here. So we're talking about a generalized way of understanding what was that word up there? Progression. That's what we're talking about, a generalized way of understanding progression. So we've got short, medium, and long-term outcomes. This is how they're often expressed. So in the short term, depending on your engagement, young people recognize the benefits. In other words, they want to be there. They want to come. Okay? They can see that there's, they, they might not be able to articulate it, but they can see it. So you're right, well, we'll, we'll come away with you. Or I'll turn up to such and such thing. Yeah, OK, I'll get involved in that drama project or whatever it is. So that's short term. There's a change in attitude. I'll, I'll have a go. That could lead to a medium outcome, medium term outcome, which is, OK, I've done this. Actually, I was pretty good at this drama thing, or I was pretty good at that climbing, or I was pretty good at, uh, or I found myself able to speak in, in company. So I'm feeling more confident about that. So that might be a medium term outcome. What then is that a platform for? And the platform could be that those skills that are acquired in that space are then transferred into other places. 
Yeah. So you see the step. First of all, you get involved. There's a change in attitude there. Then you develop certain skills or knowledge. You get the confidence from that. That can transfer into other places. So that's the notion of short, medium, and long-term outcomes. OK, thank you. Now, I don't have time to go into the language of indicators today. I've mentioned that there is an issue there, and we need to do that. But there's some work going on with that, and we can help you with that. But that is a really tough bit, it, mentally tough to do that. So when you come to do the next thing that I'm going to talk about, remember that. Yep. Here's some help with what I've been talking about so far. Some more links, some more sources. Uh, and these are pretty user-friendly type places that will help you to understand what I'm talking about. Yep. OK, so we've got the goals. We're clear about the outcomes. Then we develop the strategies. So are we going to have a youth group? Are we going to have an information program? Are we going to have some kind of residential experience? Are we going to have information? Those sorts of choices that you make about the way that you're going to address things. Then we have inputs, and that's being clear about the resources that you have available, including yourselves. Probably the main resource, yourselves. Outputs is about the amount of work you do and the type of work you do and the number of people that you are working with. Okay? So we're going to run X uh, weekends. We're going to do it with X number of young people. That kind of thing. That, actually, we're not bad at. In, in, in terms of being able to put that down and, and say what it is we're not, we're not bad at. And then we come to the outcomes. All of this, if you're clear about what you're doing, it makes monitoring and evaluation an easier process. It doesn't make it an easy process, but it makes it an easier process. And this is very valuable to researchers. So if they come into a, a, a situation and they see that you've got a clear logic model Along these sorts of lines, it makes their work a lot easier. And of course, what I've been arguing today is that every aspect of this framework should be informed by evidence. So if you decide that you say, here's the situation, here's a group of young people, what we're going to do with these is, uh, let's have some kind of um, drama group. Yeah? Where's the evidence? from anywhere that that is a good thing to do? That's the, the kind of question that we need to be asking ourselves. OK, so it can inform any, any aspect of this framework. What I've just said to you is explained here. OK, so on this slide, which you have, you have all the information that I have just uh, articulated there. So this is the kind of what goes into those sorts of boxes information. And next slide, please. This is an example that I've worked out. So here's an example of you know, a typical youth work project. And you'll be able to see here, and I'll only spend a minute on this because I'm aware of the time <coughs> running out. Here we've got the goals articulated. Here we've got an analysis, which in this case is based on a discussion with young people. And what they've come up with here is three things that are key in that situation. So one is there's an issue about personal and social development, a need, a need for that. There's another one, which is about the need to bring about an aspect of social change in the area. And a third one, which is quite specific, and it was mentioned before, it's about sexuality and sexual health. Now, what you would be able to see in a framework based on the notion of a theory of change is starting right there, how everything you do lines up back to those things, OK? So what are the outcomes that you're looking for in terms of the sexual health piece? Can we be explicit about that? What are the outcomes that you're looking for in terms of the social change piece? Can we be explicit about that? What are the outcomes in terms of personal and social development? Can we be explicit about that? And what you should be able to see is a kind of logical sequence of connections across that <coughs> graphic how you're lining up your resources behind what it is that you say you want to do. Yeah? And then secondly, how those resources are meant to interpret in terms of outputs, quantifying that, and how those outputs link to particular kinds of outcomes. 
So we've got some of those outcome statements in here. Okay. So in this example, an adventure weekend, or a series of them, was how they were going to tackle this thing about personal and social development. Okay. So it's just one way, way of doing it, obviously. Now, if it's done well, and that is the whole thing behind everything, if it's done well, because it's not automatic, if it's done well, then you end up with some outcomes, short term, participants more ready to take on new and more diverse experiences, medium term, enhanced capacity on their own part in terms of making decisions, skills acquired transfer to other areas of life. Here's a link to the other aspect of the project. Because with the same young people, if you're doing that work up there, that has benefits for the second aspect. The second aspect is a social change project. The second, action, second project is a social action project over six months where young people are engaged in doing something about an issue that's of importance to them. Now, if they have developed interpersonal skills, communication skills, the ability to work as a team, the ability to discuss things, that kind of thing, then that helps with this aspect of the project, and there you get a mutual benefit. The sexual one, on this particular example, just for the hell of it, uh, I've, I've stuck in one of these evidence-based programs, uh, and that would be worth having a look at for, for people who are interested in, in that kind of thing, because it is a, precisely in this territory about sexuality and sexual health. So why rediscover the wheel? If there's something there that you can, you can look at and use, then, then go to that. OK. Uh, next slide, please. So that's very, very quickly, uh, admittedly, uh, something about this notion of a theory of change. And I think we might have a couple of minutes now, but just before lunch, where we can maybe explore some of the issues that come up associated with that.